Welcome, friends, to Game Master's Studio, where we talk shop about running tabletop role-playing games. With us today is Jared and Ed, with your host, Jerry. Hello, and welcome to Game Master Studio, where we'll be talking about tabletop role-playing games, providing a little advice and tips and tricks you can use to try to help spruce up your games at home. I am your host, Jerry, a.k.a. Frieden Online, DM with nearly three decades of experience. With me today in the studio, we have Jared, a.k.a. DMF, proprietor of Mad Doc Designs, creator of the World of Wrath and semi-professional GM, and Ed. Four shows in, and you guys still haven't kicked me out. I'm doing good. Where's the friggin' lock? <laughs> All right. So <laughs> we're here back for the second part of our two-part episode. We kind of promised this last week, and now we're actually going to deliver on it, which is kind of a first for us. Great. We're talking about the rest of player motivations and how to identify your players so that you can engage them and avoid disengaging them, avoid turning them off, making them shut down and kind of at least mentally push away from the game. So last week, we talked about the role-playing side of the people coming to play the role-playing games. We talked about actors, we talked about planners, we talked about explorers, we talked about storytellers. Today, we're, we're going to be talking about the people who come to a role-playing game to play a game. We're talking about optimization, action junkies, problem-solving, and the watchers. So we're going to get right into that. We're starting with optimization. Because yep. if we did it anything other than first, they might be a little bit hurt over it. <laughs> they'll re-roll. <laughs> right. Or they'll find some obscure plus one bonus to, to move them up again. So optimization is the people who are playing a game and they are playing it to win. They want to be the best at whatever it is they do. Mm -hmm. The stereotype is making these people absolute combat monsters. You know, Being able to roll 2d4 and deal 100 points of damage. Um, but you can also find these players being social monsters. I'm going to be able to talk anybody into anything. You know, walk up to a guard and say, hey, did you know that I am the moon? Come down and take human form. And, of course, the moon gets to go through the locked door, so the guard will let you, right? <laughs> so, optimization. This is an interesting, because it's a tricky subject. I think it's a touchy subject. Yeah, There are people who hate it. There are people who love it. And there's not a lot of middle ground. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of, uh, uh, you know, if you're an optimizer and you're good at it, of course, you, you love it because that's the thing that you like to do. But there's also a lot of, I guess, negative aspects when it comes to no noticing that someone is an op optimizer. You might call them a munchkin or a power gamer. You know, remember that these archetypes, there's nothing really right or wrong about them. It's just the way a player likes to play. And optimizers like the numbers. They like going through and they like finding the thing that gives them that just that extra number, you know, so that they can have, you know, their defense skyrocket or their offense sky or, or whatever. And I said it earlier, these are the players who are in it to win it. And like it or not, winning is fun. Yeah. People like feeling successful and optimization makes you more likely to be successful. Yeah. People like leveling up. They like playing with bigger numbers. They like doing that. And it's it's such a rewarding feeling to have the big deal, to be the big deal. Not just to have it, but to be it. Th think of what a dungeon is. It is a, a map of creatures and obstacles on that map, and you want to get through it. And getting to the end of that is the success. It's the winning part of that, especially to an optimizer who's like, we got through this because look at all of my numbers that helped us get through this. That's a big that's a big part of the, the gaming aspect. And I can see it over in Jared's eyes. He is a skilled optimizer when he chooses to be, and I can just kind of see it. It's like, oh, oh they're they're about to get it. I'm gonna step in, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna show them what it's really like. Preach on to the truth, brother. Hang on, I'm gonna crit this bitch. <laughs> And if not, I'm going to re-roll it because I have a feat that says I can. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I agree. Um, optimizing is, you know, it comes, like you said, it comes down to people like to win. Winning games is fun. That's yeah. really what it, I like. I think that's the, the core behind it. Losing sucks. It's disheartening. It's discouraging. I think a lot of my optimization background in gaming comes from actually other games outside of role-playing games. I think that's kind of where it stems from, like, 
having right. played Magic the Gathering and stuff in the past where you have to optimize. It's all about finding <laughs> what I always refer to as like the kill switch. If I can get this card to trigger this card to trigger this ability on this monster, I win. Right. So to me, optimizing isn't necessarily about the numbers, just so much as finding that pure synergy of like, if I can do this, then I can do that. And then if I do that, then I can do this. And then, like you said, in you know, yeah. in basic dumbed down terms, I win. So again, there's there's fighting optimizers, there's the social monsters. I've gotten where I've tr- grown out of the pure fighting optimizing. I've kind of grown into where like I like to optimize themes. I think that's kind of like like my current how, character yeah. that I'm playing. How, how do you do that? How do you how do you optimize a theme? You pick a theme like again like again the character that I'm playing right now doesn't have a great AC, doesn't have the best hit points. I'm playing a bard for God's sakes, <laughs> you know, like right. not the best at anything. Although we would like to say that fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons bards have been redeemed. Yes, they used to be in in lumped in with the scrappy do of Dungeons and Dragons and Scrappy Doo. Yeah, yeah, bards were kind of. <laughs> I know, uh, I know. That's two episodes, the, the two Scooby Doo references. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, they were the they were the bunch of a lot of jokes, but I do I really like um, bards in fifth edition. But again, uh, I'm playing a bard. I'm not the best at anything. I'm not intended to be the best at anything. But and I don't necessarily think that this character is purely optimized in any one particular way. But I have a kind of a theme going on with him where our particular group is kind of going for like a little bit of a fear factor of through you know like because uh, we're playing an evil game you know intimidation and manipulation through fear. So I'm kind of really playing off of that. Like I'm taking spells that like a, like the fear spell specifically, like right on the nose, but other spells that work along those lines. So that's kind of like my theme. You know, I have a very high charisma, which is what, you know, the key skill is for Bard. I have high persuasion, high deception. I have those high charisma abilities so I can scare people. I can intimidate people. I can talk people into things. And I'm just going kind of really going for that, like charisma oriented manipulation, you know, yeah. um, power through fear kind of aspect. And that's kind of the theme of the character. My numbers aren't 100% awesome in a lot of combat categories, or even even though I'm a charisma machine, in my social stats. Some of my social stats I purposely didn't take proficiencies in, yeah. but I can intimidate a guy. And, I can scare a guy. Yeah, and that seems to be like one skill uh, of, of optimizers, or at least people who can optimize. A lot of times, like, we, we do mention, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons a lot. A lot of times you might it find your... It is the longest-running RPG out there that's exactly. still kind of in production. And you will uh, occasionally come across the uh, the game where you have to create a character using a point-by system or a preset array, so you have to optimize. You might be in a position where you are you have to make sure your character's really good at, like, the one or two things yeah, that your has, character's supposed to be good He has a role to play at. in the party, and if he yeah. can't fill that role, then what's he doing there? Exactly. So again, optimizing can be a very positive yeah. thing, you know. And I think, you know, I think it comes down to like we've mentioned several times, it comes down to player trust and player, you know, and DM trust and also player responsibility. Like yeah. if you're going to be an optimizer and you know you're going to be an optimizer, your game master knows you're going to be an optimizer, then be responsible about it. Don't just break the game because you find that loophole and you can. Try to enjoy try to self-control. Is really, I guess, what I'm kind of getting yeah. down to. Like, like, try to restrain yourself a little bit, and not to the point that you're not having fun. Obviously, optimizing is optimizing. There is no way around it. But now, as a GM, I find it's useful to find people with those strong optimizing uh, talents and use them to help newer players develop. Yep. You know, you have somebody who knows the system inside and out. Let's pair them up next to the person who is just learning the system so that they can learn and feel confident in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. We even had one game where we had assigned seats based on experience and rookie players so that a rookie player was next to all the rookies were next to somebody, if not two people, who were very comfortable with the system and could help them out and help keep that game flowing nicely. Yeah, Yeah. And I also, another thing, uh, a lot of... A lot of GMs, when they hear, opt, you know, when they have an optimizer, they're going to think Power Gamer or something almost immediately. And that can be a scary thing for a GM because you could put your, you know, you know, your big badass that you've built and then this optimizer's like, no, I kill it. You know, that's a thing that happens. But on the flip side, optimizers can be your friend. If they have, if you know they're really good at making builds and you want to challenge the group, ask them to make a build for you. You know, if this is a gamer that you know and trust and respect, say, hey. Can you make me a bill? Don't use it right away necessarily, even with that group, but that's that's a tool that you have. Mm-hmm. And 
as, as far as those tools go, I've done something similar to that, except you change it. They give you the build, and you change it. You don't change the numbers. Yeah. You change the flavor. Right, yeah. You know, the, the gun shots now become an energy blast in, like, a superhero game. Or, right. you know, he's using a great sword. No, he's using a great axe, but I'm using the same stats you gave me for the sword. So the numbers stay the same. And then if the optimizer's in that group that's facing it, they may not even realize until afterwards when you as a GM say, hey, yeah. by the way, thanks for doing that, that everything's going to click for them. And they're like, oh, why didn't I see that before? Yeah. Yeah. Two quick points I want to cover real quick because I know we need to change topics is while optimizers seem like they can be kind of breaking your game because mm-hmm. they're so good at whatever it is that they do, mm-hmm. which can be discouraging for everyone else in their party while they're like, I rolled eight damage and well, I rolled 43, 100. <laughs> right, and then so you, you have that work and be discouraging, but that means you're f- giving the optimizer too many opportunities to shine. There is a, a term that I really like that I heard from a movie a long time ago. We'll get into it, but it over specialize and you breed in weakness. If they're the greatest combat machine in the world, that means they suck at everything else, and that gives a chance for everyone else in the party to shine by doing anything other than combat. Because yeah. the combat machine is going to sit there and go, "Damn it, right. can you pick this lock?" No. <laughs> Maybe I can smash it down. It's made out of adamantine. Damn it. <laughs> so, but at the same time, the other point I want to cover real quick, I'm sorry, um, was to not do that all the time because you want to make sure that your right. optimizer is enjoying playing the game. You still got to throw some combat at them. Again, if they're a combat machine optimizer. Yeah. So everyone wants to enjoy the game, but there's easy ways around that so they're not the star of the show all the time. Yeah. Right. And you can definitely fix it, give them those wins that they need, and still keep it from the rest of the party feeling like it's become the the optimizer's show. Right, exactly. Um, Now, like we said, the optimizer, it's very common for them to get into combat. But there's also non-optimized characters who enjoy not just combat, but action sequences, the action junkies. Mm -hmm. Um, In one of my old groups, we we used the term the combat whore. Um, I know it's not quite PC, but this is the person who will do anything to get into a fight, because that's what they really want to be doing. Right. Uh, people who are looking for action, these are the people who are like, when are we going to fight? Uh, we had one player in one of our, our groups once that actually showed up and, are we ready to start playing? Well, yeah, okay, good, because I want to kill some stuff. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, and that, that's common. I mean, you, you do certainly have your, your players who want to show up to do the fight or the, uh, even just the action scene, you know, I got to, you know, climb up onto this rooftop and you know run a run across uh, uh, the the shingles or something, and you know they're yeah. coming loose. You know mm-hmm. that that can kind run, of sweat. running down the the thief. You know, like the, yeah. the beginning of the Matrix. Yeah, where, exactly. where Trinity's escaping the agents. Yeah, any kind of cinematic action scene. You know, it can even be like a skill challenge kind of uh, encounter. You know, yeah. there's different ways to set it up, but there's there's different forms of action other than fighting. But fighting is obviously the most common and, and most sought after form of action. Yeah. I think the really unifying concept here is they're looking for a risk and there has to be stakes involved. Mm-hmm. There has to be a reward, a payoff for it. Yeah. Combat is a really quick and easy way that we can we can do that and give them everything they want. But yeah, action yeah. sequences, skill challenges, as long as there's a risk, there's a reward, yeah, it's there's a chance for them stuff to happening, it. rolling dice. Yeah. Overcome odds, be the hero in that moment. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I killed all the orcs. Ta-da! I rock! You know, and actually, that's what it comes down to is rolling dice. You know, yeah. we're on the kind of the, the gamer side of role playing gamer. Mm-hmm. You know, these guys, they're the ones that want to go out there and roll the dice, you know. Yeah. Except when you're playing in a diceless system. Well, yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, there's always that. But they want, <laughs> they want the thing to happen. Right. Uh, they want to play the game. And where the optimizer might be really good at making sure they are going to play the game really freaking well. The the you know uh, uh, the action junkie the action junkie or fighter they just want to make sure the game is happening a lot or they, they get really involved yeah. when the game is happening mm-hmm. yeah which which is I think is whether a, their is bonuses a, are good or not yeah, I think that's an important junkies. distinction is the 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 action junkie or the the, the action motivated player is okay with losing. They're okay with failing. They're okay with the thief getting away. They're okay with the fight not going like they expected, you know, getting wounded and having to to rest and heal up. Yeah. They don't have to win all the time as long as they've got something that keeps them going, you know. Yeah. 
It's not whether they win or lose, but how they played the game. Exactly. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and this is one of the cases where it really does. Yeah, yeah, I think I think a lot of the people that the action junkies, the the people that like the fight and the actions, I think they go are closely related to the instigator. The instigator likes to make things happen. They like to see things move forward. You know, because we made some associations before to you know um, from on the other side to this side. I'm going to make an association from this side back to the other side. So you know, again, I think if you are one of those types where like I like action, I like seeing things happen. I want to you know have chase scenes and fight the horde of goblins. I think that they kind of fall into the instigator part of the planner. Or again, not that they're the same, but they're closely really related. You yeah, know, they they want yeah. to see the plot move forward. They want to see the story move forward. Again, they don't have you know, just like the instigator doesn't mind tripping and falling and stumbling as long as something's happening. But the action scenes, I don't mind falling off the roof if I fail my skill challenge. I don't mind losing to the the army of orcs. Right. I just want there to be action. I want there to be, you know, I want to be engaged. Right. And, and I think very much also like the instigator, like the planner, you're going to turn off the action junkie by turning down the adrenaline. Yes. Right. If you are spending an entire session sitting around in the city hall talking and planning and doing all this stuff that's gonna talking gonna and planning and, and yeah. Fall asleep. Exactly. What's going on? And then, then you get the the worst question in the world. Like, wait, what? What just happened? Oh yeah. yeah. Re- reminds me of the uh, hilarious quote out of out of a video game, actually. But the the generals are gathered around the table, and one of them stands up and goes, "The time for talk is over. Now we get to the planning." <laughs> <laughs> it's delivered so ominously, and it's like, yeah, it's just more of the same. <laughs> yeah, when you're. When your player pokes his head up from behind his computer screen or his phone and you hear, wait, so what's going on? Uh, okay. Yeah. So let's throw a fight scene in here and get this guy re-engaged in the game and see what's going on. Because you can have all the role-playing in the world. You just need to know how to moderate it and yeah. control it. Exactly. So we need to keep this action guy you know, engaged and we need to keep the role-playing people engaged. You just got to mix it up. It's all about controlling the pace. Yeah, and as a GM, I do try to have, even, even though... I'm fully. I feel I'm fully capable of having sessions that don't have a single conflict, mm-hmm. that don't have a single action sequence in them. I try to throw in at least one per session somewhere, even if it's just a random encounter on the way from one town to the next, because everybody has little pieces of all these motivations, and getting a little bit of that action going is going to get give a little charge, get people like, yeah, we, we had a little success because we overcame that obstacle. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, even role players, like you said, everyone's got a little bit of all these categories. So even the role players, and or I should say the actors and the storytellers, even there, they're going to get a little bit of it. It's nice to mix things up. It can get monotonous if it's always yeah. one thing all the time. So even though they'll get a little bit of extra adrenaline pumping, get a little bit of re-engagement, like, okay, quick little fight scene, quick little random encounter, sweet. All right, back to the role playing. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't know... You know, we had a I had a game not long ago where uh, we had like two like heavy role playing sessions in a row, which I love because you know certainly you know myself kind of role player storyteller uh, planner certainly, but then we then we follow that up with like an, like an all action uh, uh, session after, and I love that just as much because I do like the fighting aspect of it too the the rolling the dice yeah and. Uh, I'm gonna as a act- player, of course. I'm, I'm gonna one up the stakes, and we're gonna go back a couple episodes, back to talking about introducing players. When Jared was talking about how you can, in the middle of the fight, use that for a role playing opportunity, you know, the the big barbarian smashing the goblins and playing that off. Mm-hmm. Right there, you can have a fight. You can yeah. engage those actors. You can engage those storytellers by having some role playing going on while still having this is the action junkies time that they want. Yeah. It's so much harder to go the other way around to inject something that really engages the action junkie during a scene that's focused on the role player, the actors, the storytellers. Yeah. Um, skill challenge. Skill challenges are an excellent, and I think underutilized. Yep. Yeah, I think a skill challenge would be one of the few ways I could think to interject action into a role playing scene. And, and that's actually a good tip. If you know you have actors and role players, let them role play the scene out. But if you know your group, is mostly you know maybe uh, um, um, either these these first two the optimizers or the fighters just have them roll you know get, get an idea what they're trying to say what they're trying to convey mm-hmm. and let them roll their skill and then tell them how, how things work yeah. you know maybe put a get them to role play a little bit you know and, how, and, what do you say how do you say it you know 
But really, let them just roll dice. And if worse comes to worse, there's always the old mystery writer standby. When the story seems to be grinding to a halt, somebody kicks in the door with a gun and tries to kill the PCs. Yeah. <laughs> That's never a bad thing. Yeah, because you, as a DM, you have the entirety of the fight to figure out who this guy is and why he's doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, improv, it is such a wonderful skill. Yes. Indeed. Well, I think we'll have a session probably solely on improv and ideas and how to work around that. Yes, the, the, the grand list of topics, that ominous tome that we currently are the only ones with access to, um, does have improv versus preparation as, a, as an upcoming topic. Hooray! Uh, like I said, it's a huge list, so we've got quite a ways to go, but we'll get, we'll there. get there eventually. But you love us, so you're going to listen. Just keep listening. You'll keep learning. And, of course, if you have any ideas for topics, definitely feel free to get in touch with us. Share them. Um, if there's stuff you'd like to hear, if there's stuff that we haven't come up with, we can definitely add it to the list. We can bump stuff up to the top of the list if that's what the people want. We listen to the will of the people. Just make a comment on our message board. All right. See, we're, we're getting those mid-session plugs in. I love it. <laughs> so um, now we're not that, quite done here, are we? <laughs> no, no, no. We, we, we've still got two more to go, and we've got enough time to fit it in. So let's go to number three on today. We're talking about problem solving, the puzzlers. Oh, yeah. These are the people who would love to face off against the Riddler from Batman. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't like Batman Forever either, but that's a different story. Um, I'm not talking about Codpiece Riddler. <laughs> just in general. I've been playing Arkham Knight, so the Riddler left a bad taste in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the topic we go. Um, the problem solver, the puzzler, the thinker. These are yeah. the people who they want to see a cerebral challenge laid out before them. Let's give them the pieces and put it together and... Um, Personally, this is this is where I'm hardcore in there. I'm more I'm more at heart happy when we run into a riddle challenge than we are. Oh, ogres again. <laughs> um, so the problem solver, the puzzler, wants to be able to find creative solutions. As a DM, you need to provide those to them. Um, they want to think. They want to be challenged. They want to. To, to stress their 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 mind to come up with it. Yeah, and this will be a type that I think will be a, a little bit difficult to, um, to 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 notice at first. So, like as, as a GM, you know, throw in the occasional puzzle or riddle here or there, and and then you'll see them spring into action. Uh, they'll immediately, you know, you'll see them kind of perk up and uh, you know, kind of look over like, well, can you repeat that? You know. Uh, because they want to get the details of the of the riddle or the puzzle, they want to look at the, you know, what's going on. Um, we were talking last episode about the murder mystery. Yeah, that's another one where where the where the puzzler, the thinker, the problem solver is going to shine. They're going to be like, okay, okay, where was the knife found? Which way was it pointing? Where was the blood splatters? They're going to be wanting to put those pieces together in their head, figure out what's going on. Yeah, and that'll really draw them in. Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of situations, honestly, where this player type can kind of thrive, and you might not even realize it. Like any time that there, you see someone at the table engaging the other players, even out of game, you know, where they're trying to come up with the best possible outcome, right? With maybe the least amount of you know effort, or you know, just for whatever the situation is, like okay, maybe we're all stuck in jail. How do we all get out of jail? Like just basically, but thinking their way through a problem. Anytime they're trying yeah. to come up with the most you know, advantageous or efficient solution to a problem and not just going, okay, well, we can do this. Let's just do that. Like, no, no, no. Well, what if we did this? What about that? Like we earlier today, you know, from a player standpoint, Ed and I were in Jerry's game and we spent like, I don't like 20 minutes trying to figure out the best solution yeah. to a situation before we finally decided to actually put our characters into action. It's good when both your characters have message. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You can also... Uh, with these players, because this was something else that we've discussed a, a couple times, not on the shows, but we've discussed outside when we're talking GM theory, is to present a problem and not have a solution. Mm -hmm. And when the players come up with the solution, oh yeah, that's what it was all along. Right. It, yeah. It gives it gives them that win. It's like yeah. I outsmarted him. I figured out what the it was, and, and yeah. 
it's a nice way to give your your characters that 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 win. And I think I think getting that win, getting that that feeling of success, helps tie it in um, with the other gamer types that we've talked about already. The optimizers, the action junkies, the problem solvers, they're all about the feeling they get when they when they go in and they do something. Right. Whereas what we talked about last week, you know, the the actors, the planners, the explorers, the storytelling, they're all about I'm doing stuff. Yeah, they're the moment. Yeah. They're 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 in the moment and the ones we're talking about today are more about my what I got from the moment. Yeah, the results. The yeah. results, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I had to figure out how to put that down. I had mm-hmm. jotted my note down. I was like, I've got to talk about feelings. <laughs> Which was really kind of awkward because I know I did that like, during the optimizers. Uh, optimizers? Oh, I need to talk about feelings. Let's optimize our feelings. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, but role players, they're definitely about in your, or that, the, the first four that we covered last week, they're definitely about in the moment, living in the moment, being a part of that moment. Whereas I think you're right. The, you know, the, the, the ones that we're talking about today, they're more about like the end result, how it is. Well, not necessarily the watcher, but we'll get to that in a minute. But at least the other three specifically are about the results. The watcher is kind of its own beast. And yeah, like I said, we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, but the other three are definitely about, like, you know, this is the results. You know, I got to be the hero. However, for whatever reason, depending on what archetype we're talking about, I got to, you know, help save the day. Whatever the situation is, like, it's it's all about that feeling of that satisfaction for, you know, for winning, basically. Um, or even for losing, you know, but, like, seeing what happened. But everyone wants to win. Who doesn't want to win? Um, and the... the- Problem solvers, the puzzlers, um, when it, they're also a key one when it comes to winning because for them losing, nothing happens. Um, you know, even you know your your action junkies. If you lose, oh, I slip, I fall. The thief gets away. You know, the assassin takes out his target. The puzzler, I don't succeed means nothing happens. It, right. Things grind to a halt because. I need the answer. I need to solve this for us to move forward. I think of all of them, they're the type to be most disheartened by losing, because they're the they're the ones that put a lot of they put a lot of thought into it. So typically, yeah. which goes in hand in hand with a lot of time. Like I put a lot of myself into this. I spent a lot of time thinking about this. We talked this out. I thought this was the best solution to the problem with the information that I have at hand, and I failed. This right. sucks. <laughs> right, no, and I've I've actually been uh, in a situation where I, Jerry, where I used your example of make the solution they come up with the solution because I I had a uh, uh, you know kind of a, a a trick like puzzle room that they had to figure out what the puzzle was and they did all these certain things and they kept failing and I already knew what the puzzle was supposed to be and but after like twenty five minutes half an hour or so they still hadn't figured it out and then one of the players came up with a really good idea. And I just kind of said, yeah, that's going to be it. Like In my head, just get, give this to them because they're going to feel really disheartened if this isn't the idea and they can't move forward. And let me guess, they were elated. You got high fives around exactly. the table. They loved it. Yeah. 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 It's okay to have an idea for the answer to your problem in your head, but always be willing to adapt. Let, try to let your players win, especially in puzzles again, because I really think that if it the if a puzzle or any kind of thinker situation ends with a no, then you've just lost your whole table. Not just the thinkers, because everyone's involved in that moment. The thinker is usually leading the charge, but they typically get the whole table involved in those situations. Right. They try to bounce ideas. They try to take advantage of everyone's input, everyone's intellect, everyone's experience. And again, you end that whole situation with a no, which is probably one of the worst you know, words in the you know GM language anyways. Oh. Then you know, you, you've you lost your whole table. The rest of that session, in my opinion, is pretty much going to be like downhill. They've they've already checked out. And yeah, they're they're sorry. Gone. Try again next week. Yeah, you better hope there's only five minutes left before pizza time. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> pizza, a wonderful refresher to get your game back on. Pizza track. Mountain Dew, yay! All right, and we are starting to come up to the, towards the time limit. We're not there yet, but we're uh, we do want to touch on the last option. We had a lot of negative discussion about this off mic, so we are bringing in what is referred to as the eighth motivation: watching. Yep. The player who is watching is there, they're supporting the group, they're at the table, but you're not sure if they're feeling like they're part of the game. Right. Yeah, they're kind of checked out. Yeah. yeah. These are the people who are on their phones or reading a different book, like yeah. a, like a non-game-related book. Or Staring off into space. And, and let's, let's kind of 
uh, let's kind of define this is they're not they're not checked out because the thing they want to do isn't happening. Right. So like the fighter might be checked out in a storytelling area or vice versa. The storyteller or a role player might be checked out in a, in a combat that they're really not into. We don't think of that as checked out so much as taking a brain rest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These are these are people who, you know, um, start are, are just kind of there. Start to finish. Yeah. There's n- they n- they never really perk up and move yeah. to the table. Yeah. At, yeah. At no point during the session or at any point during your however many session game have they ever really engaged. Right. I typically think of the watcher as the new player like hey uh, I'll check out this role playing game and I'll just kind of sit in on some sessions I'll roll up a character yeah. and just kind of see what happens so they're learning the game they're getting gaining a comfort level and that's fine in my opinion and if you're new and you're watching that's cool if you're a 15 year <laughs> veteran of role playing games and you're the watcher you either shouldn't really be a role player in my opinion yeah i, I mean or you should really um, work with your gm and find what, like, there's got to be something that engages you. There's got to be a reason that you're at that table. You're looking for something. Well, hold on. Now, I have, to, I have to disagree with you a little bit on this. You could be a watcher who's really just there for the atmosphere. You're there because your friends are playing. You're not really that invested in the game itself, but you really want to hang out with your friends. But and then you're, you're that extra player who's helping make sure that the group has, you know, the, the, the bard or the, or the cleric or the, the rogue or whatever the group needs. Yeah. But then it's the DM's responsibility. This guy is here. He's part of my group, but he's not really participating the way that the others yeah. are. How can I turn the, the, the story and change things around to bring him more in? Right. Yeah. This is part of the GM's responsibility to look at that and identify, okay, what type of person is he? Hey, this guy, he did a lot of theater. He's done some creative writing. Mm-hmm. Maybe I can try to do some role playing that's specifically geared towards him. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. I personally think that if you're a long time, quote unquote, watcher, then that your GM's not doing his job to a degree. And again, some of it comes down to player responsibility, but you should be finding ways to engage them. And it might take time. I'm not saying it's going to be an easy, quick process. I'm not, you know, obvi- I'm not saying that. Oh well, if you've never run a fight, obviously, because otherwise he'd be engaged because he likes fights. I'm saying that you need to purposely engage them and try to get them in several different scenarios and That's test right. the water and start to get them engaged. Because if they've been, you know, if they've been at your, this is session twenty and they're still just sitting there playing around on their phone, dude. If you just want to hang out with your friends, like I would never, I never really want to discourage people being at the table, like you know, like grow the cult, <laughs> but there's movie night for hanging out with your friends and eating popcorn. Like, you know, you're just, it, it, you're kind of just taking up space at my table at this point. I thought we weren't going to get to make any of the cult jokes. <laughs> <laughs> um, for long time players. Yes. For new players as watchers, I've seen a couple GMs do this. I've really wanted to do it myself, but never had an opportunity. Hey, this is my friend. He wanted to check out a session. Do you mind if he sits in yeah. and watches? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. I mind if he sits and watches. Come here. We're going to roll you up a character. We're going to get you into the game. I don't know how to play. That's why we're going to show you. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great way to bring people in and grab them and help head off that watcher syndrome before it sets in. Yeah, I mean, I've brought new people into games on many time, you know, many occasions, and they typically start out as a watcher, but then, you know, six, seven sessions in, next thing you know, they're starting to engage a little bit. I've found things that have interest them. Okay. Now they're the a little bit of if, the adventurer fighter type. All right, if cool. that long, yeah. Sometimes you can get them in the first session. They're a little, they're a little wary, and by the second session, they're like, "Well, everybody else is making a fool of themselves, so I don't feel so bad about yeah. it." Yeah, usually it just takes a few sessions. I, well, like, I, I should have said, I think the longest it's taken me is seven or eight sessions. Look, I'm not saying that a watcher will never participate. They'll they'll participate. You know, and definitely new players tend to be watchers more until they find themselves as a player. But there are also players who are just watchers. That's all they're ever going to be. And that's, I think we, I think we're kind of feeling like that's a negative tone. I don't think that's true. I think they want to be there. I think we're feeling that that is negative on the GM. In no way is it, well, not in no way, but it's not necessarily the player's fault. I think a GM needs to acknowledge that the watcher's okay. there and help bring them in I, I, rather than, than condemning the watcher. How dare you watch? You're right. I can see that. You do want to engage your watcher. 
you know, periodically. And if they respond well to it, engage with them a little bit more. But also remember, you might have a player who just wants to play. He, maybe he's not good at the optimization. Maybe he's just kind of there to play the game, not really to role play so much, but just to be there. And that's fine. Maybe you don't want to, you know, six of them at your table, but that's fine to have one. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I get where you're coming from. I mean, I'm not saying that having a watch at your table is a bad thing. Yeah. I just personally think that if they're even just to support a friend, if they're willing to be at that table, then there's a reason for that. Yeah. And other than just being a friend, like if they're willing to subject themselves to sitting around us exactly. for six hours. <laughs> There's something that they're looking for. There's, they think that there might be something to this that they might enjoy, which means it's our responsibility to find that thing. I, okay, I got you. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and and you know, cause we know the games inside and out. Right. They might not know what it is that they're yeah. going to like. They might, they might, you know, it might be one of those things that you come to have to prod out of them. Like, but deep down inside, like they're actually like a really a diehard role player or deep down inside. Like they really like, They've seen this one fantasy movie, Lord of the Rings, and they really like the action scenes. Like they yeah. want to just live that and have that as. A, but you have to pull it out of them. You I gotta, want to be Orlando Bloom. You know, but, <laughs> but again, it's your responsibility to find what it is. But they're looking for something. There's a reason that they're at that table. They're not just there to support their friend. It might be the you know you know I've seen people. Oh well, I, you know my husband plays, yeah. so I'm going to give it a shot. They're giving it a shot. It's your opportunity to find something that they're interested in. And if they sit down for more than one session, then there is something there that yeah. you can find and pull out of them. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. All right. So we are actually running a little longer than usual, but we made sure that we're okay with that. Uh, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you for listening. Um, we want you to check out our um, contact us on our message boards, gamemasterstudios.proboards.com. Check us out on Twitter at GMS Studios, including the link to Jared's fan film Kickstarter that still has a couple of weeks left. Um, you can check us out on Facebook, send us messages, comments, likes, and all that. If there's any topics you'd like to see, if there's any questions you'd like to co us to cover, we definitely appreciate the feedback. And we'll see you next time we're in the studio. Have a good one. Bye-bye.